Good morning. Welcome to another version of Knittings and Sewings. This is episode 11. This morning I am drinking, my favorite tea of all time is Earl Grey, and this morning I'm drinking uh, the Tea of Republic's Earl Grayer, one bag of it, mixed with one bag of their Blackberry Sage. And I'm in my, using my new cup that I got at TJ Maxx. Can't beat a $5 mug to bring a smile to your face. And so I enjoyed going there yesterday. And I also picked up, while I was there, I love the queen. And so I got this tin, this tea tin with 72 tea bags featuring the queen on the cover. And it has a mixture of Earl Grey and then the English breakfast tea and the English afternoon tea. So it has all three teas in one tin. I'm gonna really enjoy using that this summer. And so that is what I am drinking. And I always like to buy at TJ Maxx, I love to buy their teas, their coffees, and their jams. They have real fruit jam that is just delicious. I think it's like four or five dollars for a little jar. So if you haven't tried that, it's made out of real fruit. And they just have a wonderful little cooking section there at the TJ Maxx. So I highly recommend a visit there. And I also this week got a little, in the purple thing, this purple is my favorite color after all. I got a little purple notebook. It's already getting a little bit dirty because I've been using it. Um, this is just a little notebook to write my notes about my projects and to keep track in my purse of thoughts about my projects, ideas, any kind of inspiration, I try to jot down in this little book. And it's also, I've been using it to journal some of my feelings about my projects, such as the feelings I've been having as I shared with you last time about feeling a little bit pulled in all directions and needing to get grounded again. Having this little journal to jot about my feelings about the projects and my creativity is a really nice place to make those notes and have it with me in my purse. So that is what I have been doing with that. I also mentioned that, um, oh, before we go any further, <laughs> I'm a little out of order this morning. That's okay, this is gonna be a chatty video. But I do wanna mention for those that might happen to be new, new here, that I am a fiber uh, crafter who does many different fiber arts, including knitting, spinning, weaving, sewing, both hand sewing and machine. And weaving, did I say that? Uh, my primary focus is on making handmade garments for myself primarily. I'm trying to make my own wardrobe and I've largely succeeded in doing that. Almost every day I do have something I'm wearing that is handmade by me. So uh, I am working on that, that type of uh, handmade slow wardrobe. And I think I'm the poster girl for slow wardrobes because since I work on so many different crafts at once, nothing goes very quickly. And so uh, even though I'm fast paced in many other areas of my life, in my walking, my talking, my thinking, my ideas, I'm very slow paced when it comes to the fiber arts, partly because I'm doing several crafts at once and also because um, I'm just kind of dibbing and dabbling in different things and so it takes longer. I do a truly a slow process from beginning to end. My ideal projects are ones where I have made the yarn, where I've spun the yarn, where I have made the fabric myself and then either sewn the fabric or knitted it uh, or crocheted in some cases. So um, anyway, I'd been having this little desire to get back into crocheting which I hadn't done in quite some time. And so I did get out my crochet hook again. And I like these little crochet hooks like this, the little, I don't know if these are clovers or what, I can't remember, but I like those. And I decided to work on a top to wear to Fiber U, which is coming right up here soon. I'm really getting prepped and excited for it. I think I get as excited and happy leading up to a fiber event as I do during it and after it. I mean, I really look forward and anticipate that type of event, and especially Fiber U is my all-time favorite, and it's going to be coming up in Lebanon, Missouri here very soon. So I have been working on 
making a crochet top. This is a mesh top to wear over a tank top. And I am almost finished with it, not quite. It does fit me now. It is where I want it on length, except I need to add a couple of rows to finish it at the bottom. And I'm getting ready to do that this morning after I get through talking to you. And there's also a little finish uh, row along the neck edge as well. But other than that, I am almost there. So I'm gonna be able to wear this. I'm really looking forward to wearing it to Fiber U. And um, I wanna mention before I go any further about it, I wanna mention that the yarn I used <clears throat> is Metallica by Hobby. I don't know if it's pronounced Hobby or Hobby, H-O-B-B-I-I. -I. It's a Denmark company online that I buy yarn from and I really love it. And uh, this is one I got on sale, so I got little 100 gram balls, uh, but they, because it's a mesh top, you don't need all that many of them. I think I'm only used six balls of it, maybe even five. So because of the mesh, you don't use a ton of yarn. And I love the fuzziness of the yarn. I love, it looks metallic, but it's, you know, it's got that fuzziness and it is acrylic. This is no, there's no animal fiber in here. So because of that, when I finish it, I'm gonna be using a steamer instead of wet blocking it like I usually do with my other wool projects. This will definitely be steamed. And I'll probably put it on my mannequin, Millie, and then steam it right on the mannequin to make sure that, you know, it fits and looks good on. So I'll be doing that later today. And I'll share the finished finished top with you when on the next podcast. I'll probably be wearing it and letting you see me modeling it. So that's what I'll be doing. And then I'm going to be wearing under it. Three years ago, I was really into natural dyeing. And I did a natural dyeing project with this tank. It was a white tank originally from the thrift store. And I bathed it in blueberries because blueberries were on sale in June. And I, so I bought a bunch of blueberries and I mordant it with alum. And uh, it is a fugitive dye. Blueberries, in fact, berries in general, are not, supposedly they're fugitive because they can fade, will fade supposedly with sunlight and a lot of time, they will not last indefinitely. So gradually this will fade softer and softer lavender color. But that's fine with me, I don't mind that. And I can always over dye it. So that isn't a problem at all for me. And I have had it three years already and I've washed it many, many times. So this is still, yes, it may be a little lighter lilac color or lavender, but who cares? <laughs> I don't mind that at all. So if blueberries go on sale again at a really good price, who knows, I might over dye it, but otherwise, I don't mind it the way it is. So just want to warn you about that. If you do like the idea of dyeing with berries, uh, that is something that happens and I did want to not mention that. But when we were talking about the mesh, I've been longing to do a mesh top. You could also use do this if you want to do a longer version. You could do it uh, as a bathing suit cover up, swimsuit cover up, or even a dress. You can make it as long as you want after you get past the underarm area and get the um, main part at the size you need. Crystal, who devised this pattern, she's a designer, Crystal of Bagaday Crochet, has a wonderful tutorial on how to do this step-by-step. -step. She does not have a written pattern, but she does have a step-by-step -step tutorial that will get you right through it. Even if you're not a real experienced crocheter, I think you can do this. This was my first crocheted top, and my friend Judy met me at Panera several times, first to get it started, and then to help me along as I made some uh, some mistakes. And one of the big mistakes I made was that I accidentally, because of the fuzzy yarn, I started crocheting backwards for a while. And so instead of having your right side is supposed to be your loopy side, just like with knitting, and on the back, the wrong side is supposed to be your bumps. Well, because of the fuzziness of my yarn, I couldn't see that. And so after I set it down and came back to it later, to work on it, I was going backwards. So she had to help me frog part, undo part of it. I couldn't just easily undo it because of the stickiness of the yarn. So she actually had to do surgery and cut part of it back a few rounds to get it back to where we needed to be going in the right direction. So I thank Judy, she's always my crochet guru. 
even though I've been crocheting for years, because I dabble in everything, I never really get extremely experienced at any one craft, except I think knitting. Knitting is my exception. I feel like I'm a pretty intermediate, intermediate to perhaps even advanced knitter, but everything else, I am a dabbler. So I never get extremely good at anything. So Judy is a crochet expert, <laughs> and I always use her as her expertise to help me out of any crochet uh, problems I have. And I really, I love being able to have a friend in Judy. She and I are going to wear our. Um, she's going to be at Fiber U. So she and I, she made one also in a wholly different. She made it in cotton, a variegated cotton. So we'll be wearing those, and I'll probably try to put up a shot of us wearing those in the next episode. Well, we'll go out to dinner and be twins. So um, look for that in the next podcast. But I'm really excited about Fiber U. I'm excited about wearing this top, and uh, I think it, it's going to turn out really well. Next, I want to talk about the books I've been reading. I've been reading some two excellent books that I have to share with you. Um, I am... A big fan of Amor Towles. I believe his last name is pronounced T-O-W-L-E-S. He is an amazing author and a few years ago I read Gentleman in Moscow. A Gentleman in Moscow which was one of my favorite books. I loved it. Very charming. And in that book it spans 30 years uh, with an aristocrat being sentenced to stay in a hotel where he lives. He's sentenced to never leave there. And so if he does, he'll be arrested. And it's set in Russia. Uh, I'm not sure the time setting, but around the time, well, I don't know. I think the 1800s sometime. Uh, at any rate, that is a great book. But his latest book is called Lincoln Highway. He works on his books for years. It takes him years and years. And this one is the opposite of his other book in that it is set in 10 days, a span of 10 days. And it's a road trip book. So the boys in it are coming of age. It's a coming of age story. And very character driven, but also has a great plot. And in this latest book, they are uh, taking uh, Highway 30, which is the Lincoln Highway. They start out and they're on a road trip. I can't say much more about it. The character development is phenomenal. And there are some insights that I gleaned from this book, as you always do with him. He's very philosophical in his uh, development of his characters. And each character has such a unique voice. These are totally different in writing style from his other book. But I love this book. It stayed with me and I just keep thinking about it. It's one of those kind of books. And so if you like a deeper book, on the surface it's very entertaining and fun and you read it very quickly, but it's also one of those deeper books that stays with you and you think about some concepts in it uh, for quite a while after you finish reading it. So I really loved it and highly recommend it. Secondly, on a lighter note, um, I read one that many of you may have heard about, in fact, I think it was on a Today Show recommended read by Jenna, but I read it because my silent book club on Facebook recommends amazing books, and a lot of people on there had recommended uh, Remarkably Bright Creatures, and so um, I think her name is Sarah Van Pelt. I just finished it a couple of days ago. I was listening to it as an audible in the car. It also was very compelling and a much lighter, more fun read than what I usually read. Uh, very heartwarming. And it also is a coming of age story. Uh, it deals with some dysfunctional family issues and some really, just, just a very deep, heartwarming book. And of course it has a giant Pacific octopus in the story as well. So if you're an animal lover, you'll also uh, love that aspect of it. But it all comes together so nicely, and I don't want to say more about it either. It's just one of those books you have to experience. But I think it's a perfect, light summer read, and it's definitely a feel-good story that, unlike many, many books, will leave you inspired instead of depressed. So I think for that reason alone, in the summer, we need some light, fun reading too, right? Last year, I read a book called 
uh, Midnight at the Blackbird Cafe. And this was one of these books that I enjoy, uh, the genre of magical realism. Uh, this is one of those books, and it is by Heather Weber. Um, this is set in the mountains of Alabama in a kind of, I'm sure, a fictional town called Wicklow. And the main character, Anna Kate, has returned to bury her grandma, her beloved grandmother, who owned the Blackbird Cafe. And it was supposed to be a quick trip to close the cafe and settle her grandma's estate, but she ends up, of course, being immersed in this quirky southern town that her mother ran away from many years ago. And there's this mysterious Blackbird pie that everybody can't stop talking about. So anyway, it's just a fun book. Again, a nice, light summer read. But it has kind of stayed with me too in a lot of ways, and I'm tempted almost to reread it. Uh, and after, ever since this, I've been drinking this blackberry sage tea because it, and I actually at the time uh, had to go out and buy some blackberries and try a lot of different recipes because it got me hankering for blackberries. <laughs> Always in summer, I want to eat. Oh, I want to talk about, um, I've been really interested in for a long time, color analysis. This is one of those obsessions I get into periodically. And I've apparently been in an obsessional frame of mind lately. So I dipped back to the color seasons. I don't know if any of you ever were analyzed or your mother was analyzed when she was back in the 80s. They had the Color Me Beautiful and you could be a different season. Well, now I think they've expanded these out to 12 different seasons, but basically a similar concept. And for years, I thought, I dyed my hair red and I assumed I was an autumn because my natural hair was kind of a medium brown, kind of a mousy brown. And since I have gray green eyes, I thought, I don't know, my mother was an autumn and she'd been diagnosed as an autumn by the color analysts of the time. So I just assumed I was autumn. I always uh, did my you know, red hair, dyed my hair red, but as I started growing out my natural hair, it, I realized, and of course even as, it, as I was before that, I realized my hair was what I thought was mousy brown, but it's just really a very ashy brown. Dark, kind of dark brown as you can see. And so, I always assumed I was in autumn. I dressed a lot when I had red hair in autumnal type colors, and autumn is my favorite season. So, for years, that's what I focused on, but I did love purple. Purple has always been my favorite color. And so, um, and I looked good in fuchsias and purples and pinks, but um, anyway, after letting my natural hair grow out about nine years ago, um, I realized, no, my hair is very ashy and my skin has always been very pale. And so I've, I've wondered many times, am I really a cool undertone? And I've been fascinated with this color me system, these different systems for a long time. But what happened is, uh, gosh, about five years ago, on one of the um, forums that I was talking with people about the color analysis, um, the, uh, I've been trying to, oh, another thing about it, I've been trying to self-analyze, because I'm frankly too cheap to go out and get a real color analysis, so I kind of am trying to do it a self self-made uh, self-made analysis and so I started realizing after studying it for quite a while and seeing my natural hair started realizing no you know I think I'm a very cool undertone my mom is is a warm undertone she has very you know typical autumnal skin and when she was growing up her hair was a goldeny brown but mine has never been a golden brown and so it's an ash brown and so I finally realized, you know, I think I'm actually cool rather than warm, you know, season. And so, um, and I thought at time would, was I winter because my hair is dark brown, but actually uh, I've been realizing for a while that my color is actually summer cool, cool summer. So this is a palette for a cool summer. And, um, you know, it's a lot of purples and pinks and grays and, uh, you know, all kinds of blues. So that is my color palette. So 
so interesting enough. I just wanted to mention that because um, I recently did find a website for those of you that want to take the inexpensive version. I, I just couldn't afford, frankly, a color analysis. Um, many of them, I mean, I'm sure they're worth it. They do a lot of draping and they, they work with your makeup and your hair and your, you know, hair color and your wardrobe. But the reason this is, I'm bringing this up is because, um, and I have the gray green eyes, which I always thought was, was not, for some reason I didn't realize that summer. I always think of summers as blondes. And, um, so it turns out though that the gray green eyes are definitely, and because my eyes are kind of not a bright green or gray, but just kind of a, um, hazily mixed kind of, not hazel and brown, I have no brown, but just kind of a mixture. The term hazel has always confused me too, by the way, because hazel to me sounds brown, but mine are not at all brown. They are gray eyes with green. And if I wear, if I wear, uh, you know, blues, they can look almost bluish, but they're not. And the more gray comes out, it's like a muddy gray. Uh, because it has the green and then if I wear green my eyes look very green so that's kind of been confusing to me for all my life am I what color am I and I've always been fascinated with it but I found a website is why I'm bringing it up now it called colorwise.me that is a free gives you a free little color analysis and it lets you put a picture of yourself and I suggest you do more than one picture because if you don't have the picture in natural light without makeup it can you can get different results so you really should uh, ideally do it in natural light like I'm out here today in natural light and without makeup would be the probably give you the truest result and I would try more than one photo in my case this week I tried several different photos from different stages of my life and even as most of my adult life I had red hair it still came up with me as a cool summer so this kind of verified what I've been thinking for many years, and I've been going toward making my wardrobe, a summer wardrobe, uh, you know, because I used to have all these autumnal things, and now most of my wardrobe is designed around that cooler palette. And so I definitely, now it explains why I've always looked good in fuchsias and purples. And I've never been a fan of blue, but I'm starting to become more of a blue person because it does look good on me, I have to say. Um, teal looks great on everyone, regardless of your palette. But if you would like to check yourself and if you're curious about that kind of thing, I think it can be helpful, especially since we work on our clothes, if we're doing a wardrobe for ourselves. We work a lot, spend a lot of time and effort doing this, and we might as well gear up to something that will complement our natural coloring. So I just find it a good guide. I don't follow it religiously. If I want to wear a color that is not in my spectrum, then of course I, f I feel free to do that. I don't, you know, limit myself. Like my shallography shawl, for example, is in all those autumnal colors that are not the best for my season. But uh, I love autumn and I love those colors. So I still wear them, but it is good to know your basic color palette it is helpful to know and so if you're interested in that feel free to pursue that I think it is interesting oh one more story we have to share Wally decided to come visit us and so um, anyway one thing I have to share with you is yesterday when we were out my mom and Bob and I did our favorite some of our favorite things one was to go to thrift stores and we also had lunch at a wonderful little cafe that kind of reminded me of the Blackbird Cafe. It's a local neighborhood cafe. And uh, anyway, we were there, but we also went to one of our favorite thrift stores. Uh, and so while we were there, I didn't think I was going to find anything at first. But as it happened, I'm always looking for jeans jackets. Let me show this quote. I am wearing a jeans jacket that I was able to pick up there. Uh, and I'm gonna just turn around and show it. It's a Gap jean jacket. I love the detailing on the sleeve, the shoulder. And then I see that it has been decorated. It has the little fringe on the bottom. It has the little heart in the middle of the back there. 
and so um, I was really thrilled to get this jacket. I love the way it fit, I love the way it looked, and it's a gap jacket. But I could tell that this little fringe, and it's funny because I just put fringe on mine, on my jacket last couple of weeks ago when I made my creative jacket. And as I'm looking at this closer, I'm thinking, is this something that Gap did, or is this someone, something someone else embellished? And as it turned out, as I looked at it closer, I, I realized, looking at the stitching, the little embroidery, here is a close-up. I realized, no, no, this is not something that Gap did. This is someone embellished this. Um, first of all, they did a fringe along the whole bottom of the jacket, which is something I just did on my own jacket a few weeks ago. And I love that fringe. That was sewn on a sewing machine. Then they also put this, oh, here it is. This heart, they hand embroidered with a blanket stitch. And I know that this is someone did this because there's a knot on the back of this. They did it with black thread and they sewed it on themselves, hand sewed it. This is machine sewed. And I noticed though that there's one on the end here, another little heart, random heart. And I thought that's kind of random. And I looked more closely at it and realized, wait a minute, it looks as if they had a very similar heart right here because there's black threads as if someone's cut the heart off. There's another one here and another one here. So there should have been one, two, three more hearts. Yeah. Three more hearts that someone has cut off with the little black threads. So, I, what I believe happened uh, with this jacket, in my, you always tell a story in your head when you go to a thrift store and there's a mystery like this. But I believe what happened is someone made this for their loved one. Someone may have been a mother or grandmother, made it for somebody they loved and gave it to them. And that person didn't like the leopard hearts or maybe they didn't like the whole thing. Maybe they were intending on cutting all this off and just keeping the jacket. But at any rate, they stopped. And I figure they left this one after figuring that this was too much work to undo all this. And they may have realized that this is sewn on with the machine. And so it's too much work to deconstruct the jacket. I don't know exactly the real story. What do you think happened? I just love these kind of mysteries, these thrift store mysteries. But I believe that uh, I love the jacket. I was thrilled to get it, and I'm going to wear it with the same uh, pride of ownership that I believe the original maker intended for the person they made it for. So I do a lot of thrift store rescue. Have you ever done that before? Have you come upon a hand-knitted or crocheted afghan with someone's hand-knit tag on it? Or have you salvage something like this yourself. It's a lot of fun going to a thrift store. You never know what you're going to find. One more thing I want to talk about uh, that's coming up and I hopefully my friend Judy, the one that we made the same crochet top, she was wanting to get involved in the Stephen West sock along that is coming up. I have to admit, I went to Unwind Fibers, my favorite local fiber store here, and I decided to, it's going to start July 6th, it's going to run I think for three or four weeks, I think four weeks. But Judy wants to get into sock knitting, and she's mainly a crocheter. She has done the Stephen West geography with me, and we had that a couple of years ago. Um, so she really wanted to try out the Stephen West sock along. Stephen has really gotten into knitting socks these year, this year. And so I decided I did not have, because I've used up a lot of my yarn stash, as I told you, I de-stashed a few years ago and I've really used up or gotten rid of most of my yarn except my novelty yarn, which I love. I'll never get rid of my novelty yarn. I actually use that all the time in my weaving and, and stuff. So. I did go to unwind and get, this is a contrasting sock, he says. So I went and got Emma's yarn, and this one is in the shade of Twilight, which is kind of a purplish color. It's almost, it's a muted purple though, that goes well with a summer, my summer colorway. And then this 
very light pink. It's so light, it probably doesn't show up as pink even. But it's very, very light pink. It's called um, Sweet Magnolia. Both of these are Emma's yarns. And so I think it gives me the high contrast that he wants for this sock. And we'll see how that goes. It's supposed to start July 6th. And so I am going to dive into it and see how that goes. If it stresses me out too much, I will stop. But I think I will enjoy doing it, especially since Judy and I are doing it together. And then um, I got some Addy Flexi Flips needles, which I love, that I'm gonna use size zero for, they're, they're the floppy needles, and there's three of them. I'm gonna use these for my, uh, Stephen West sock long. So I'll be telling you how that goes. I still haven't finished up my jean socks that I've been wanting to do. There's so many things I feel pulled about on socks. I don't knit them quickly. And so I haven't had a real good sock year this year, but I'm hoping that this will motivate me. And if it doesn't stress me out too much, she and I will be doing those socks together. And I look forward to working on those if I end up doing them. But again, I'm not gonna stress myself out if I don't. Because right now I just need to de-stress, get centered, and do what I feel like doing. Because this is my hobby. This is my fun. And it shouldn't be a source of added stress, right? Um, one more thing, this is the last thing I wanna talk about, is that there is a tour de fleece I have participated in this for years, but not, I don't join a team and get fully immersed in it like a lot of people do. But I had bought this, it's a silk yak fiber and it's those summer colors, it's, except it does have a little bit of a goldy stuff in it that's not. But it's got a lot of greens and beautiful fuchsias and a kind of summery golden yellow, purple, and oh, and this beautiful teal. These, I think, will make a beautiful, it's, it's uh, this is by a company, or an independent dyer named Greenwood, but I purchased it at the Yarn Barn booth at the last little conference I went to. They had a few vendors, and this one was Yarn Barns. It's a hand-dyed um, yak, 80, no, 50% yak, 50% silk. And one thing, I'm going to be spinning this during Tour de Fleece, which runs from July 1st to July 23rd. And I'm going to be spinning whatever I feel like spinning. My goal is simply to spin a little something every day. Because spinning is definitely my best balm for my mental health. It makes me feel better to spin. And so I'm going to be spinning this, and I'm going to be spinning this in the fold because I looked it up and with the silk yak combination, these two are actually at odds, these fibers. The yak is a very short staple and the um, silk is long. And so the best way I read to spin this is by doing it from the fold. So I will be spinning this from the fold. I'm not exactly sure yet how I will be Spinning I have to figure out more about what I'm going to be doing if I'm going to be doing a fractal spin with it or How I'm going to be plying it. Um, I think I might do a fractal spin So I think I'll be dividing this up and not I don't think I'm going to do a chain ply with this I'm going to try doing a fractal spin and see how it goes But I'll let you know the update on that as I start working with it So I should be doing that soon, but my goal. I'm not joining a team for tour de fleece this year no way. I'm not joining a team. I'm not putting myself under pressure. I'm going to enjoy spinning. My goal is to get back into spinning, do it every day, and use the wonderful spinning wheels I have acquired this year. Uh, the two electric spinning wheels and then my other two that are, are in my spinning wheel herd. The other thing I want to get back to doing is my wonderful uh, naturally dye, or natural, not dyed, my natural BFL that I have been processing. I have kind of slacked off on working with this. This year I haven't done much at all. I need to get back into this because I now have two ideas of what I'm going to knit in the way of sweaters with this. It is going to be knitted. And so it's just so springy and wonderful and will make a wonderful cardigan. 
So I'm, I'm toying between two different sweaters. And once I decide which way I'll go, I'll let you know. But I, I'm gonna be spinning more on this. I keep saying that, but I really am. With the Tour de Fleece, I'm gonna be using it as inspiration to get back to spinning this wool. And I am now finished with the Van Gogh spinning, the blue that I was doing, so that's done. I applied it last night, the final, the final uh, skein of that. So I will now be going back to the uh, this project and trying to think about more to narrow down which of the two sweaters I'm going to want to do. But I love this yarn. I love how oh my gosh how smushy it is and springy. It's spun woolen and I really love it. So I'm probably going to leave it in the natural even though I don't know if it'll be the most flattering with my coloring. If I do decide to dye it later I might but I'm just not sure. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, one thing, I want to add one more thing about my hair coloring, because in the last video, even my mom said, and several other people commented, they asked me if I frosted my hair because it looked like I had dyed my hair blonde, bleached my hair blonde. No, I did not. As you can see out here in the natural light, I never will. I love my natural color now. I went all those years hiding my natural color with this red, and I didn't mind the red. I, I enjoyed, you know, being a pretend redhead, but honestly, I felt it went with my light pale skin. But honestly, ever since I went back to my natural hair nine years ago, and now I'm just letting the natural silvering happen. So everything that you saw in the picture last time that appeared to be uh, blonde was actually my natural silver. So no, I have not dyed my hair, bleached it, nor will I. I enjoy it the way it is. I uh, do try different hairstyles, and, and I do have this newer hairstyle I started a few weeks ago, got it trimmed, got it cut into a new style, like a shaggy type style. And I'm going back for another trim right before Fiber U. So I'll be going next weekend to get a little trim. But no, I will not dye my hair. It is still the ashy brown with the silvering, natural silvering. So until next time, I think I have about chatted you out, right? We've talked about everything, and um, so I will be finishing up, going upstairs, finishing up the crochet on this. Then I'll be steaming it with the steamer on my mannequin, and hopefully I'll be wearing it next time, and I'll next time have a lot to chat with you about because I will have gone to Fiber U, and I will be doing a full Fiber U report. Till next time, love what you're making and wear what you make.